Hi, my friends, it's Kate, and we're back for more of James and the Giant Peach. Last you'll recall, the peach had been released from its stem and had begun to roll down the hill away from poor Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker. Actually, as I remember, it rolled right over them. All right, chapter 16. And now the peach had broken out of the garden and was over the edge of the hill, rolling and bouncing down the steep slope at a terrific pace. Faster and faster and faster it went, and the crowds of people who were climbing up the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them, and they screamed and scattered to the right and to the left as it went hurtling by. At the bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over a telegraph pole and flattening two parked automobiles as it went by. Then it rushed madly across about 20 fields, breaking down all the fences and hedges in its path. It went right through the middle of a herd of fine Jersey cows, and then through a flock of sheep, and then through a paddock full of horses, and even through a yard full of pigs. And soon the whole countryside was a seething mass of panic-stricken animals stampeding in all directions. Peach was still going at a tremendous speed with no sign of slowing down, and about a mile farther on, it came to a village. Down the main street of the village, it rolled with people leaping frantically out of its path, right and left, and at the end of the street, it went crashing right through the wall of an enormous building and out the other side, leaving two gaping round holes in the brickwork. This building, building happened to be a famous factory where they made chocolate and almost at once a great river of warm, melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes in the factory wall. A minute later, this brown, sticky mess was flowing through every street in the village, oozing under the doors of houses and into people's shops and gardens. Children were wading in it up to their knees and some were even trying to swim in it. And all of them were sucking it into their mouths in great greedy gulps and shrieking with joy. But the peach rushed on across the countryside, on and on, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Cow sheds, stables, pigsties, barns, bungalows, hay ricks, Anything that got in its way went toppling over like a nine pin. An old man sitting quietly beside a stream had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as it went dashing by. And a woman, woman called Daisy Entwistle was standing so close to it as it passed that she had the skin taken off the tip of her long nose. Would it ever stop? Why should it? A round object will always keep on rolling as long as it's on a downhill slope, and in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean, the same ocean that James had begged his aunts to be allowed to visit the day before. Well, perhaps he was going to visit it now. The peach was rushing closer and closer to it in every second and closer also to the towering white cliffs that came first. These cliffs are almost in as fame are, these cliffs are the most famous in the whole of England, and they are hundreds of feet high. Below them the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast, and all the men who were in them as well. The peach was now only a hundred yards away from the cliff. Now fifty, now twenty, now ten, now five. <gasps> when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap into the sky and hang there suspended for a few seconds, still turning 
over and over in the air. Then it began to fall down, 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 smack, and hit the water with a colossal splash and sank like a stone. But a few seconds later, up it came again, and this time up it stayed, floating serenely upon the surface of the water. Chapter 17. At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was one of indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the room amongst a tangled mass of centipede and earthworm and spider and ladybug and glowworm and old green grasshopper. In the whole history of the world, no travelers had ever had a more terrible journey than those unfortunate creatures. It had started out well, with much laughing and shouting, and for the few, first few seconds, as the peach had begun to roll slowly forward, nobody had minded being tumbled about a little bit, and when it went bump, and the centipede had shouted, that was Aunt Sponge, and then bump again, and that was Aunt Spiker, there had been a tremendous burst of cheering all around. But as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to flow down the steep hill, rushing and plunging and bounding madly downward, then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself flung up against the ceiling, then back to the floor, then sideways against the wall, then up to the ceiling again, and up and down and back and forth and round and round, and at the same time, all the other creatures were flying through the air in every direction, and so were the chairs and the sofa, not to mention the 42 boots belonging to the centipede. Everything and all of them were being rattled around by a mad giant who refused to stop. To make it worse, something went wrong with the glowworm's lighting system and the room was in pitch darkness. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain and everything kept going round and round, and once James made a frantic grab at some thick bars sticking out from the wall, only to find that they were a couple of the centipede's legs. Let go, you idiot, shouted the centipede, kicking himself free, and James was promptly flung across the room onto the old green grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's leg, legs, a horrid business, and towards the end, the poor earthworm, who was cracking himself like a whip every time he flew through the air from one side of the room to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was a frantic and terrible trip, but it was all over now, and the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning slowly and painfully to disentangle himself from everybody else. Let's have some light, shouted the centipede. Yes, they cried, light, give us some light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best. Please be patient. They all waited in silence. Then a faint greenish light began to shimmer out of the glowworm's tail. And this gradually became stronger and stronger until it was anyway enough to see by. Some great journey, the centipede said limping across the room. I shall never be the same again, murmured the earthworm. Nor I, 
the ladybug said. It's taken years off my life. But my dear friends, cried the grasshopper, trying to be cheerful, we are here. Where? They asked, where? Where is here or there? I don't know, the old green grasshopper hopper said, but I'll bet it's somewhere good. We are probably at the bottom of a coal mine, said the earthworm gloomily. We certainly went down and down and down very suddenly at the last moment. I felt it in the pit of my stomach. I still feel it. Perhaps we are in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music, the old green grasshopper said. Or near the seashore, said James eagerly, with lots of other children down on the sand for me to play with. Pardon me, murmured the ladybug, turning a trifle pale, but am I wrong in thinking that we seem to be bobbing up and down? Bobbing up and down, they cried. What on earth do you mean? You're still giddy from the journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over it in a minute. Is, is everyone ready to go upstairs and take a look around? Yes, yes, they chorused. Come on, let's go. I refuse to show myself out of doors in bare feet, the centipede said. I have to get my boots on first. For heaven's sakes, let's not go through all that nonsense again, the earthworm said. Let's all lend a hand and get it over with, the ladybug said. Come on. So they did, all except Miss Spider, who set about weaving a rope ladder that, that, that would reach them from the floor up to the hole in the ceiling. The old green grasshopper had wisely said they must not risk going out of the side entrance when they didn't know where they were but they must first all go up onto the top of the peach and have a look around. So half an hour later, when the rope ladder had been finished and hung and the 42nd boot had been laced neatly onto the centipede's 42nd foot, they were all ready to go out amidst mounting excitement and shouts of, here we go, boys, the promised land. I can't wait to see it. The whole company climbed up the ladder one by one and disappeared into a dark, soggy tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply, almost vertically, upward. Chapter 18. A minute later, they were out in the open, standing on the very top of the peach near the stem, blinking their eyes in the strong sunlight and peering nervously around. What happened? Where are we? But this is impossible, unbelievable, terrible. I told you we were bobbing up and down, the ladybug said. We're in the middle of the sea, cried James. And indeed they were. A strong current and a high wind had carried the peach so quickly away from the shore that already the land was out of sight. All around them lay the vast black ocean, deep and hungry. Little waves were bibbling against the side of the peach. But how did it happen? They cried. Where are the fields? Where are the woods? Where is England. Nobody, not even James, could understand how in the world a thing like this could have come about. Ladies and gentlemen, the old green grasshopper said, trying very hard to keep the fear and disappointment out of his voice, I am afraid we find ourselves in a rather awkward situation. Awkward? cried the earthworm. My dear old grasshopper, we are finished. Every one of us is about to perish.
perish. I may be blind, you know, but that much I can see quite clearly. Off with my boots, cried the centipede. I cannot swim with my boots on. I can't swim at all, cried the ladybug. Nor I, wailed the glowworm. Nor I, said Miss Spider. None of us three girls can swim a single stroke. But you won't have to swim, said James calmly. We are floating beautifully, and sooner or later a ship is bound to come along and pick us up. They all stared at him in amazement. Are you quite sure that we are not sinking? The ladybug asked. Of course I'm sure, answered James. Go and look for yourself. They all ran over to the side of the peach and peered down at the water below. The boy is quite right, the old green grasshopper said. We are floating beautifully. Now we must all sit down and keep perfectly calm. Everything will be all right in the end. What absolute nonsense, cried the earthworm. Nothing is ever all right in the end, and well you know it. Poor earthworm, Ladybug said, whispering in James's ear. He loves to make everything into a disaster. He hates to be happy. He is only happy when he is gloomy. Now, isn't that odd? But then, I suppose just being an earthworm is enough to make a person pretty gloomy. Don't you agree? If this peach is not going to sink, the earthworm was saying, and if we are not going to be drowned, then every one of us is going to starve to death instead. Do you realize that we haven't had a thing to eat since yesterday morning? By golly, he's right, cried the centipede. For once, the earthworm is right. Of course I'm right, the earthworm said, and we're not likely to find anything around here either. We shall get thinner and thinner and thirstier and thirstier, and we shall all die a slow and grisly death from starvation. I am dying already. I'm slowly shriveling up for want of food. Personally, I would rather drown. But good heavens, you must be blind, said James. You know well, very well, that I'm blind, snapped the earthworm. There's no need to rub it in. I didn't mean that, James said quickly. I'm sorry, but can't you see that? See, shouted the earthworm. How can I see if I'm blind? James took a slow, deep breath. Can't you realize, he said patiently, that we have enough food here to last us for weeks and weeks? Where, they said, where? Why, the peach, of course. Our whole ship is made of food. Jumping Jehoshaphat, they cried. We never thought of that. My dear James, said the old green grasshopper, laying a front leg affectionately on James's shoulder. I don't know what we'd do without you. You are so clever. Ladies and gentlemen, we are saved again. We are most certainly not, said the earthworm. You must be crazy. You can't eat the ship. It's the only ha thing that is keeping us up. We shall starve if we don't, said the centipede. And we shall drown if we do, cried the earthworm. Oh dear, oh dear, said the old green grasshopper. Now we are worse off than before. Couldn't we just eat a little bit of it? Asked Miss Spider. I am so 
dreadfully hungry. You can eat all you want, James answered. It would take us weeks and weeks to make any sort of dent in this enormous peach. Surely you can see that. Good heavens, he's right again, cried the old green grasshopper, clapping his hands. It would take weeks and weeks. Of course it would, but let's not go making a lot of holes all over the deck. I think we'd better simply scoop it out of the tunnel over there, the one we've just come up by. An excellent idea, said the ladybug. What are you looking so worried about, Earthworm? The centipede asked. What's the problem? The problem is, the earthworm said, the problem is, well, the problem is there is no problem. Everyone burst out laughing. Cheer up, earthworm, they said. Come and eat. And they all went over to the tunnel entrance and began scooping out great chunks of juicy, golden-colored peach flesh. Oh, marvelous, said the centipede, stuffing it into his mouth. Delicious, said the old green grasshopper. Just fabulous, said the glowworm. Oh, my, said the ladybug primly. What a heavenly taste. She looked up at James and she smiled and James smiled back at her. They sat down on the deck together, both of them chewing away happily. You know, James, the ladybug said, up until this moment, I have never in my life tasted anything except those tiny little green flies that live on rose bushes. They have a perfectly delightful flavor, but this peach is even better. Isn't it glorious? Miss Spider said, coming over to join them. Personally, I have always thought that a big, juicy, caught-in-the-web blue-bottle fly was the finest dinner in the world, until I tasted this. What a flavor, the centipede cried. It's terrific. There's nothing like it. There never has been. And I should know, because I personally have tasted all the finest food in the world. <laughs> Whereupon, the centipede, with his mouth full of peach and with juice running down all over his chin, suddenly burst into song. I've eaten many strange and scrumptious dishes in my time, like jellied nets and dandy prats and earwigs cooked in slime. And mice with rice, they're really nice when roasted in their prime. But don't forget to sprinkle them with just a pinch of grime. I've eaten fresh mud burgers by the greatest cooks there are. And scrambled dregs and stink bug eggs and hornets stewed in tar. Pails of snails and lizards' tails and beetles by the jaw. A beetle is improved by just a splash of vinegar. I've eaten boiled slobbages, they're grand when they're served beside. Minced doodle bugs and curried slugs, and have you ever tried? Mosquitoes toes and warm fat rose, most deliciously fried. The only trouble is they disagree with my insides. I'm mad for crispy wasp, wasp stings on a piece of butter toast and pickled spines of porcupines and then a gorgeous roast of dragon's flesh well hung, not fresh. It costs a buck at most and comes to you in barrels if you order by the post. I crave the tasty tentacles of octopi for tea. I like hot dogs, I love hot frogs, and surely you'll agree. A plate of soil with engine oil's a super recipe. I hardly need to mention that it's practically free. For dinner on my birthday, shall I tell you what I chose? Hot noodles from a poodle on a slice of garden hose and a rather smelly jelly made of armadillo toes. The jelly is delicious, but you have to hold your nose. Now come, 
the centipede declared. The burden of my speech, these foods are rare beyond compare, some out of reach, but there's no doubt I'd go without a million plates of each for one small bite, one tiny bite of this fantastic peach. Everybody was feeling happy now. The sun was shining brightly out of the blue sky and the day was calm. The giant peach with the sunlight glinting on its side was like a massive golden ball sailing upon a silver sea. Chapter 19. Look, cried the centipede just as they were finishing their meal. Look at that funny thing, that funny black thing gliding through the water over there. They all swung around to look. There are two of them, said Miss Spider. There are lots of them, said the ladybug. What are they? asked the earthworm, getting worried. They must be some kind of fish, said the old green grasshopper. Perhaps they have come along to say hello. They're sharks, cried the earthworm. I'll bet you anything you like that they are sharks and they have come along to eat us up. What absolute rat, the centipede said. But his voice seemed to have become a little shaky and he wasn't laughing. I am positive they are sharks said the earthworm. I just know they are sharks. And so, in actual fact, did everyone else, but they were too frightened to admit it. There was a short silence. They all peered anxiously at the sharks who were cruising around slowly, slowly, round and round the peach. Just assuming that they are sharks, the centipede said. There still can't be possibly any danger if we stay up here. But even as he spoke, one of those thin black fins suddenly changed direction and came cutting swiftly through the water right up to the peach itself. The shark paused and stared up at the company with small evil eyes. Go away, they shouted. Go away, you filthy beast. Slowly, almost lazily, the shark opened his mouth, which was big enough to have swallowed a perambulator and made a lunge at the peach. They all watched, aghast. And now, as though at a signal from their leader, all the other sharks came swimming in toward the peach, and they clustered around it and began to attack it furiously. There must have been 20 or 30 of them at least, all pushing and fighting and lashing their tails and churning the water into a froth. Panic and pandemonium broke out immediately on top of the peach. Oh, we are finished now, cried Miss Spider, wringing her feet. They will eat up the whole peach, and then there'll be nothing left for us to stand on, and they'll start on us. She is right, shouted the ladybug. We are lost forever. Oh, I don't want to be eaten, wailed the earthworm, but they will take me first of all because I am so fat and juicy and have no bones. Is there nothing we can do? Asked the ladybug, appealing to James. Surely you can think of a way out of this. Suddenly they were all looking at James. Think, begged Miss Spider. Think, James, think. Come on, said the centipede. Come on, James, there must be something we can do. Their eyes waited upon him, tense, anxious, Pathetically hopeful. Chapter 20. There is something that I believe we might try, 
James Henry Trotter said slowly. I'm not saying it will work. Tell us, cried the earthworm, tell us quick. We'll try anything you say, said the centipede. But hurry, hurry, hurry. Be quiet and let the boy speak, said the ladybug. Go on, James. They all moved a little closer. There was a long pause. Go on, they said frank frank frantically. Go on. And all the time while they were waiting, they could hear the sharks thrashing around in the water below. It was enough to make anyone frantic. Come on, James, the ladybug said, coaxing him. I, I, I'm afraid it's no good after all, James murmured, shaking his head. I'm terribly sorry. I forgot we don't have any string. We need hundreds of yards of string to make this work. What sort of string? The old, asked the old green grasshopper sharply. Any sort, just so long as it's strong. <laughs> My dear boy, that's exactly what we do have. We've got all you want. How? Where? The silkworm, cried the old green grasshopper. Didn't you notice the silkworm? He's still lying downstairs. He never moves. He just lies there sleeping all day long. But we can easily wake him up and make him spin. And what about me, may I ask? said Miss Spider. I can spin just as well as any silkworm. What's more, I can even spin patterns. Can you make enough between you? asked James. As much as you want. And quickly? Of course, of course. And would it be strong? The strongest there is. It's as thick as your finger. But why? What are you going to do? I'm going to lift this peach clear out of the water, James announced firmly. You're mad, cried the earthworm. It's our only chance. The boy's crazy. He's joking. Go on, James, the ladybug said gently. How are you going to do it? Sky hooks, I suppose, jeered the centipede. Seagulls, James answered calmly. The place is full of them. Just look up. They all looked up and saw a great mass of seagulls wheeling around and around in the sky. I'm going to take long silk string, James went on, and I'm going to loop one end of it around a seagull's neck. And then I'm going to tie the other end to the stem of the peach. He pointed to the peach stem, which was standing up like a short, thick mast in the middle of the deck. Then I'm going to get another seagull and do the same thing. And another and another. <gasps> Ridiculous, they shouted. Absurd. Poppycock. Balderdash. Madness. And then the old green grasshopper said, how can a few seagulls lift an enormous thing like this up in the air? And all of us at as well. It would take hundreds, thousands. There is no shortage of seagulls, James answered. Look for yourself. We'll probably need 400, 500, 600, maybe even a thousand. I don't know. I shall simply go on hooking them up to the stem until we have enough to lift us. They'll be bound to lift us in the end. It's like balloons. You give someone enough balloons to hold, I mean, really enough, then up he goes. And a seagull has far more lifting power than a balloon. If only we have the time to do it. If only we are not sunk first by those awful Sharks, <gasps> you're absolutely off your head, said the earthworm. How on earth do you propose to get a loop of string around a seagull's neck? I suppose you're going to fly up there yourself and catch it? The boy's dotty, said the centipede. Let him finish, said the ladybug. Go on, James, 
how would you do it? With bait. Bait? What sort of bait? With a worm, of course. Seagulls love worms. Didn't you know that? And luckily for us, we have here the biggest, fattest, juiciest earthworm in the world. You can stop right there, the earthworm said sharply. That's quite enough. Go on, the other said, beginning to grow interested. Go on. The seagulls have already spotted him, James continued. That's why there are so many of them circling around. But they daren't come down to get him while the rest of us are all standing here. So this is what... Stop! cried the earthworm. Stop, stop, stop! I won't have it. I refuse. I, I... Be quiet, said the centipede. Mind your own business. I like that. My dear earthworm, you're going to be eaten anyway, so what difference does it make whether it's sharks or seagulls? I won't do it. Why don't we hear the plan first, said the old green grasshopper. I don't give a hoot what the plan is, cried the earthworm. I am not going to be pecked to death by a bunch of seagulls. You'll be a martyr said the centipede. I shall respect you for the rest of my life. So will I, said Miss Spider, and your name will be in all the newspapers. Earthworm gives life to save friends. But he won't have to give his life, James told them. Now listen, listen to me. This is what we'll do. Chapter 21. Why, it's absolutely brilliant, cried the old green grasshopper when James had explained his plan. The boy's a genius, the centipede announced. Now I can keep my boots on after all. Oh, I shall be pecked to death, wailed the poor earthworm. Of course you won't. I will, I know I will, and I won't be able to see them coming at all because I have no eyes. James went over and put an arm gently around the earthworm's shoulder. I won't let them touch you, he said. I promise I won't, but we've got to hurry. Look down there. There were more sharks than ever now around the peach, the water was boiling with them. There must have been 90 or 100 at least. And to the travelers up on top, it seemed as though the peach were sinking lower and lower in the water. Action stations, James shouted. Jump to it. There's not a moment to lose. He was the captain now and everyone knew it. They would all do whatever he told them. All hands below deck except earthworm, he ordered. Yes, yes, they said eagerly as they scuttled down the tunnel entrance. Come on, let's hurry. And you, centipede, hop down the stairs and get silkworm to spin at once. Tell him to spin as he's never spun before. Our lives depend on it. And the same applies to you, Miss Spider. Hurry on down, start spinning. Chapter 22. In a few minutes, everything was ready. It was very quiet now on top of the peach. There was nobody in sight. Nobody except the earthworm. One half of the earthworm, looking like a great, thick, juicy pink sausage, lay innocently in the air for all the seagulls to see. The other half of him was dangling down the tunnel. James was crouching close beside the earthworm in the tunnel entrance, just below the surface, waiting for the first seagull. He had a loop of silk string in his hands. The old green grasshopper and the ladybug were further down the tunnel, holding on to the earth's, earthworm's tail, ready to pull him quickly in out of danger as soon as James gave the word. And far below, in the great hollow stone of the peach, the glowworm was lighting up the room so that the two spinners, the silkworm and Miss Spider, could see what they were doing. 
The centipede was down there too, exhorting them both frantically to greater efforts. And every now and again, James could hear his voice come up faintly from the depths shouting, spin, silkworm, spin, you great fa fat lazy brute, faster, faster, or we'll throw you to the sharks. Here comes the first seagull, whispered James. Keep still, earthworm, keep still. The rest of you, get ready to pull. Please, don't let it spike me, begged the earthworm. I won't, I won't. Shh. Out of the corner of one eye, James watched the seagull as it came swooping down towards the earthworm. And then suddenly it was so close that he could see its small black eyes and its curved beak and the beak was open ready to grab a nice piece of flesh out of the earth, earthworm's back. Pull, shouted James. The old grasshopper and the ladybug gave the earth, earthworm's tail an enormous tug, and like magic, the earthworm disappeared into the tunnel. At the same time, up went James's hand, and the seagull flew right into the loop of silk that he was holding. The loop, which had been cleverly made, tightened just the right amount but not too much, around its neck, and the seagull was captured. Hooray, shouted the old green grasshopper, peering out of the tunnel. Well done, James. Up flew the seagull with James paying out the silk string as it went. He gave it about 50 yards and then tied the string to the stem of the perch. Next one, he shouted, jumping back into the tunnel. Up you get then, earthworm. Bring up some more silk, centipede. Oh, I don't like this at all, wailed the earthworm. It only just missed me. I even felt the wind on my back as it went swishing past. Shh, whispered James. Keep still. Here comes another one. So they did it again, and again, and again, and again. And the seagulls kept coming, and James caught them one after the other and tethered them to the peach stem. One hundred seagulls, he shouted, wiping the sweat from his face. Keep going, they cried. Keep going, James. Two hundred seagulls, three hundred seagulls, four hundred seagulls. The sharks, as though sensing they were in danger of losing their prey, were hurling themselves at the peach more furiously than ever, and the peach was sinking lower and lower still in the water. Five hundred seagulls, shouted James. Silkworm says he's running out of silk, yelled the centipede from below. He says he can't keep it up much longer, nor can Miss Spider. Tell them they've got to. James answered. They can't stop now. We're, we're lifting, somebody shouted. No, we're not. I, I felt it. Put on another seagull, quick. Quiet, everybody, quiet. Here comes one now. This was the 501st seagull. And the moment that James caught it and tethered it to the stem with all the others, the whole enormous peach suddenly started rising up slowly out of the water. Look out, here we go, hold on. But then it stopped and there it hung. It hovered and swayed, but it went no higher. The bottom of it was just touching the water. It was like a delicately balanced scale that needed only the tiniest push to tip it one way or the other. One more will do it, shouted the old green grasshopper looking out of the tunnel. We're almost there. And now came the big moment. Quickly, the 502nd seagull was caught and harnessed to the peach stem. And then suddenly, 
but slowly, majestically, like some fabulous golden ball with all the seagulls straining at the strings above, the giant peach rose up, dripping out of the water and began climbing towards the heavens. That's all for now. See you next time.